How do you respond to life's ups and downs? When, when everything's on the up and up, do you feel blessed and excited and encouraged? And when it comes to the down and out, do you feel cursed? In the early 1800s, there was a man named George Mueller. This is a picture of him, his epic beard. But George Mueller, he made a point of his ministry. He was a pastor who felt God called him to open an orphanage. And his, his, his vision for his ministry is he wanted to show that God is in control and God provides for his people. So he opens this orphanage to care for the orphans in his community. And during his time there, 10,000 children go through the doors of the orphanage. And there was one day where in the morning, the headmistress came to George and said, look, the children are ready for school. They're bathed, they're clothed, they're ready for school. But there's no food to provide them with breakfast. The cabinets are empty. The pantry is barren. There's nothing on the stove. And all of these needy little children have nowhere else to go. How are we going to provide a meal for them? And George says a very peculiar statement. Have the children sit at the breakfast table. We're about to thank God for the food he's going to provide. What? George, like, did you hear me? We don't have food to provide these kids. And so they sit down at the breakfast table and George leads them in prayer. Thanking God for the food that they don't have. And a couple of moments later, a knock comes on the orphanage door. On the other side of the door is a baker. And the baker tells George, look, I couldn't sleep all night long. I couldn't sleep. I had this overwhelming feeling that you needed bread this morning. So he woke up early to break three extra batches of bread. And he brought them to the kids at the orphanage. See, there was no way to provide, and yet God is working in ways unseen to George or these kids to provide for their needs. A few moments later, another knock comes on the orphanage door. It's a milkman. His milk cart happened to break down right outside the orphanage on the morning where they don't have breakfast. And he comes up to George at the orphanage and he says, look, my cart has broken down. By the time it's fixed and I can deliver this milk, it will have spoiled. Can you use 10 large cans of milk? And George says, I think we can. God is working in ways unseen behind the scenes. He is providing for George and these orphans. You see, in God's kingdom, there is no such thing as coincidence. God is in control. And that very same God that George Mueller knew in the early 1800s is the God of the book of Ruth. A God who is in control of all things at all times. And who can provide according to our needs. And we see that as one of the major themes of the book of Ruth. And last week, Pastor Paul kind of walked us through chapter one, where we see Naomi and Elimelech, their husband and wife, they love each other. They got these two boys, Malan and Kilian. And this is during the time of the judges. And so Israel is in this downward spiral of, of just uh, sin and rebellion judgment, coming back to God, sin, rebel, judge, sin, rebel, judge. And it's just a cycle over and over and over. And it says there was a famine that arose in the land. And because of the famine, Naomi and Elimelech uproot their family and leave the covenant community of God in Israel and move to a place called Moab. Now Moab was an idolatrous nation. They believed in a God called Chemosh. And another God called Ashtoreth. Some scholars believe that in order to worship Chemosh, you had to sacrifice your child. And the worship of Ashtoreth involved lots of sexual sin. So they, they leave the, the, the nation of Israel. They leave the promised land of God, uproot their family, and they move to a spiritual wasteland. And there they settled. 
And the one verse after it says, they settled there in Moab, the next line is, then Elimelech died. Tragedy comes in. Naomi's husband, who she loves, her provider, is gone. And even though she's grieving, she still has hope because she has her two boys to help provide for her. But about 10 years later, while they're still in Moab, her two sons die as well. And now there's not one widow, there's three. Their needs just multiplied. There's three women who couldn't provide for themselves. This was a very patriarchal culture. Women were second-class citizens. They didn't own property. They couldn't provide for themselves. Their only hope for a future was their husband. And now these three widows have no hope for a future. And the rest of chapter one is Naomi having this realization that we left the promised land. We came to a spiritual wasteland. And and now I am a spiritual wasteland. She grows bitter. She views her future as empty. And there's this moment where she decides, I'm going back to Bethlehem. And I believe, though it doesn't say for sure, I believe she was going there to die. She had given up. There's no hope for me. My husband is dead. My sons are dead. These two girls are needy. I can't provide for any of us. I'm as good as dead. I'm going home so that I might at least be buried in my homeland. And she implores her daughters-in-law, leave me. I am cursed by God. Leave me. I have nothing to offer you. And after much uh, convincing, Orpah, one of her daughters-in-law, leaves and goes back to her country and, and, and her family and her community. But Ruth, it says, Ruth clung to Naomi. And she makes an astounding statement. She says to Naomi, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. This is astounding. She's forsaking the community she grew up with. She's forsaking the God she would have been taught to worship. She's saying, I am now committed to Naomi, to the community of Israel, and to the Lord God of Israel. And at the very end, as they're leaving to go back to Bethlehem, there's a glimmer of hope. The barley harvest is in season. The story's not over. So we're going we're gonna to pick up in chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And I think uh, as, as we're going into this, there's, there's a, a, a lot of cultural things that are happening here that I, I want to make sure we go ahead and clarify some terms. Firstly, uh, providence. Providence is God's loving provision that he provide, just like he did for George and the orphans, in ways unseen, God is providing. Another term that we'll use today, sovereignty. Sovereignty is God's total control over everything, right? Man plans his steps, the Lord directs his path. And lastly, liberate marriage. This was uh, uh, a a command of God in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 25, where he says, if somebody is widowed, like Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah, if somebody is widowed, it is the responsibility of an unmarried kinsman, somebody in the family, to marry that widow, that the lineage may continue, that their property could be redeemed, and that they might have a future hope for for provision for them and their family. And so we'll be talking through some of these ideas as we go through the chapter. But Ruth chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative of her on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now note, this is the author saying this. Ruth and Boaz aren't aware of this. In, in her grief, Naomi has been fogged in by grief. And she believes there's no hope. There's no kinsman redeemer. There's no opportunity for levirate marriage. There's no redemption for Naomi, she believes. And the author starts chapter two with 
wait a minute, there is. There is somebody who fits this description. Even though Naomi had forgotten it, God is doing something behind the scenes that she couldn't see with the fog of grief over her. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, almost every time it mentions Ruth in the book of Ruth, it calls her Ruth the Moabite. This is a continual reminder of where she came from, a pagan nation, and what she forsook to be committed to God, his people, and to be committed to Naomi. Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. This is the idea of what they called gleaning. This was a command of God when the law was written that uh, property owners who grew crops were not to scour their field. This was uh, a way for the property owner to be generous to the needy. It was about generosity, but it was also about dignity. That, that the needy could come into the field and work for their food. And so this is like a social welfare or a social workfare program that God had instituted for generosity and dignity to abound in this idea of the needy. Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Now remember, in God's kingdom, there is no such thing as happenstance or coincidence. And I love how it says, as it turned out, huh, imagine that. God is doing something here. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? Now, if you ask that question in 2022, you're going to get slapped, okay? You don't, <laughs> it, it, but it doesn't mean what it sounds like. What he's asking is not, she's an object or a product. He's saying, of what lineage, of what tribe, what family heritage does she come from? I, he would have been used to probably the same harvesters coming to his field see every season, season after season. And he sees somebody that is not normally there and she's gleaning in the field. And he's, who is that? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. Okay. Elimelech, in verse 1, it says he's a man of standing. And that's a twofold idea there. Number one, he was a man of wealth and influence and power in the community. On the other side of a famine, this dude had monetary gains. I mean, he was doing well. The Lord had blessed him even in the midst of a famine. But the second meaning of that is that this is a godly man. He's a God-fearing man. And you see this as, as the chapter unfolds, the character of Boaz, that of a, a man of grace and love and compassion, much like Jesus. And so when Boaz hears this is a Moabite, he has every reason to run the other way, right? pagan, idolater. We know how they worship their gods. But that's not what he does. She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. She's been working hard, right? Ruth most likely believes this is her lot for the rest of her life. This is, she's going to be providing for this widowed woman that she loves dearly, Naomi. And it's almost as though Boaz is having this conversation with the lead harvester. And as soon as he finds out who she is, he's like, all right, I'm done with this. And in the next verse, it says he just makes a beeline for Ruth. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. 
Don't go and glean in another field. And don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. This would have been a dangerous thing. Ruth would have been extremely vulnerable. She has no husband to protect her. And in this culture, a woman, like I said earlier, was a second class citizen, let alone a Moabite woman. This is dangerous. She's vulnerable. I just, I want to pause here for a moment. What is your response to the needy around you? Ruth is extremely needy. And she's providing for somebody else as well who's needy. What is your response when you see the needs of others? You see, I think there's really kind of three different responses we can take. Firstly, we can distance ourselves from the need. Turn a blind eye, look the other way. It's not my problem. I don't need to deal with this. Do you distance yourself from the needs of others, pretending that it's not, it doesn't exist? Or do you take advantage? You see the needy, you realize that there's some opportunity maybe for gain for you in that situation, you take advantage of them. I think that's why Boaz said, I told all my young men to leave you alone. They have some character issues, right? They see a woman and they're, they're going to abuse her. When you see the needs of others, maybe you don't abuse people, but do you take advantage of them? Or do you respond like we're going to see Boaz do? Where you lovingly provide for their need in a dignified manner. He allows Ruth to earn her meal. He allows her to glean in his field. What is your response to the needs of those around us? If I'm honest with you, it's very easy for me to want to turn a blind eye. I can't do anything about it anyways. But as followers of Christ, we're called to, with dignity, yes, but have compassion on those around us that are needy. Didn't Jesus do that over and again in the Gospels? So, this woman, Ruth, she's in the field, she's been working, and, uh, and she's very needy. And Boaz says, stay here. We're going to provide for you. We're going to protect you. There's safety and security in my field. At this, responding to Boaz's generosity, his, his offer of protection and provision, At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She drops to the ground in response to this this man of standing offering provision and protection, sacrificially giving of himself to her. She bows down to the ground. This is unthinkable. She's aware of the social norms at play here. She asked him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? She's like, look, I got two strikes against me. I'm a woman and a Moabite. Why did I find favor in your eyes? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband how you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. That last line is the most important piece there. He said, why why are you experiencing favor? Because you've come to take refuge under the wings of the Lord. It's like God is this powerful eagle caring for its eaglets. And Ruth has come to take refuge under God. That's why she's found favor. She's experiencing grace as a result of coming to the Lord. 
May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, verse 13, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. Later on that day, verse 14, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. Now, meals in our culture can become just very hurried, rushed, and I got to get some sort of sustenance in me so I can do the job, right? You eat a breakfast burrito on the way to work while you're talking to your wife on the phone and driving a car, right? Like, it's just like, I got to get this over with, right? You eat in the break room for 30 minutes on your lunch break. But in this culture, meals are extremely relational. So yes, he's offering her a meal. But more than that, he's saying, come, sit at the table with me. I'm opening an invitation for you to come into my life. He's building relationship. And she sits down with the harvesters and eats until she's full. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Sheaves were what the the harvesters put together. This This is the crop that they need. This is his livelihood. Boaz is going above and beyond for this woman. He's lavishing grace on her. He didn't have to do this. He could have just allowed her to glean in the field. But he allows her to do that. And then he provides protection. He tells his young men to leave her alone. He offers her water. He brings her into this meal. And now he's allowing her to glean even among the crops that they've harvested. This is lavish grace. He goes even further. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. Don't rebuke her. Right? The dignity. Leave them there for her to pick up. But he's providing for her. He's going above and beyond. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. She was a hardworking woman. She gleaned in the field until evening. Then threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah. Now, I don't, none of us in our kitchen have a measure that's an ephah, okay? That's not a term we're, we're used to. But an ephah was about 30 to 50 pounds. 30 to 50 pounds of barley for one day's wage. That's a ton. Uh, the average worker back then, uh, most scholars would say, get between one and two pounds a day. This is a month's supply of food for Naomi and Ruth. This is lavish, amazing favor. Boaz has gone above and beyond. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. She carries this this ephah of barley back to town, right? Now remember, Naomi's been home in the city all day. And I wonder, it doesn't say, but I wonder, Ruth's been gone all day. And Naomi, in her grief, did she think, man, this is just evidence. Either she died or she abandoned me, but I'm cursed by God. So this just lines up with everything I've experienced so far. I have no hope. I'm alone. Did she feel as though God had smitten her such that there was no chance for redemption. And in comes Ruth. She carries this barley back to town. Ruth also brought out, uh, excuse me, verse 18. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. So Ruth shows up with this sack over her shoulder and Naomi's eyes are the size of plates. Like, what? I believe she's amazed by the gracious provision of God through Boaz. Maybe my life isn't over. Maybe there is hope. I believe this is where that fog begins to lift, where she's beginning to see 
what God might be up to. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. The cogs in Naomi's brain begin to turn as the fog continues to lift. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Again, coming back to love or rape marriage. That, that Boaz was somebody who could marry a widow in this family to provide an offspring for the lineage and to redeem the property. This is a picture of there might be hope for our future. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. I love like each chapter of the book of Ruth is like a cliffhanger, right? Chapter one, everything's terrible, but there's the barley harvest. What? What's going to happen, right? It's like an episode of Lost. You're watching, you're engaged, and there's all these mysteries, and then the word lost comes up. You're like, come on, I got to wait till next week. But every chapter has this kind of cliffhanger moment of what is God going to do? I think there's a couple of things that are so important in chapter two for us to begin to understand what God is doing in this story. The first I want us to see, I want us to see the providence of God. God's loving protection and provision. The providence of God. Let's look at it in the passage. So she, this is verse three and four. She set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. She happened to get there. That's not happenstance. She happened to come with Naomi to Bethlehem. She happened to go gleaning to provide for them. And it happened that Boaz was the field she was gleaning in. And it just so happens that Boaz comes from Bethlehem to check on his workers. And it just so happens that Boaz is a godly man of standing. I mean, this is not happenstance. This is God working out things behind the scenes in a way they never saw. This is the providence of God. Think about how long God has been working to make this moment happen. You see, the book of Ruth doesn't start with Ruth chapter one. It starts when the law was written and the law about being able to glean in the field was written and and the, the law about being able to marry a kinsman redeemer was written. God has been working for generations to make this moment happen. He's powerful. He's sovereign. He's in control of all things. And we see now kind of the culmination of all of this beginning to form. God is providentially providing for Naomi and Ruth beyond what they could see, especially Naomi in her grief. She couldn't see this. God is up to something. He was working all things together for his glory and the good of his children. And I think there's really two different types of providence that I see in the, in the book of Ruth. The first one is, is sweet providence, right? In chapter one, we see this early on. Naomi's got a limelech. They love each other. They got two boys. Those boys are, are a, a, a way to provide for them. Her husband's a way to provide for them. Right, And they're pursuing sweet providence, right? They got this family, but there's a famine in Israel. And so in pursuit of this sweet providence where where everything's good, 
right? Finances are good. We've got the food we need. All of our needs and wants are provided for. They're taken care of. And so in pursuit of that, they leave the land of famine and go to Moab where there's food. You see, I think the danger of those moments where we're walking through sweet providence is that we can tend to drift from God. I wonder if in this moment, Naomi's got her family, everything's perfect. The only problem is, is we need some food. So they leave the covenant community of Israel. They, they leave the promised land and end up in a spiritual wasteland. And the spiritual wasteland ends up in them. During times of sweet providence, we can drift from God. I don't really need you, God. And we may not even say that or think that, but in our actions, in our words, and in the way we believe about our life, I don't need God. Why? Things are good. Right? God is kind of the crisis hotline. I'm good. We can drift from God. How do you respond when, they're, when you're walking through those pro- times of sweet providence? How we should respond is with gratitude. God, thank you. Thank you for this family. Thank you for these finances. Thank you for this life. But I'm afraid, at least for me, my experience is my natural tendency is to drift away. And what is your response in sweet providence? And then there's another type of providence we see in the book of Ruth, bitter providence, right? It's the, it's the rest of chapter one. Naomi's husband's dead. There's no hope for her future. Her sons die. There's three widows. This is a catastrophe. This is when everything falls apart, when the loved one is lost, when a disease comes into the picture, when there's no hope for your future, when you're overwhelmed and fogged in by grief, bitter providence where the hand that God has dealt you is painful. I was talking to uh, Pam Alden. Uh, She's on staff at South Umqua and she was talking to me about some bitter providence she's been walking through where she has been uh, dealing with lots of physical problems. And she had a realization. She was asking God, why, God, why is this happening? Why are you doing this to me? Don't you love me? Why? She said, I had a realization the night before our conversation. She had this realization. Instead of asking God, why? Why are you doing this? I realized I needed to change the question to God. What are you wanting to do in me during this pain? What do you want to produce in me? I I don't understand. And maybe why will never be answered. What do you want to produce in me, Jesus? And I want want to walk this extremely carefully. I don't want anybody here to feel shame or belittled. Grief is a legitimate process to go through. It's just not a place to set up camp. It's a terrible place to live. And I know some of us, are walking through immense grief where we lost somebody dear to us or, or, or disease has come into the picture or health is failing or finances and job loss or even you know, the COVID season was a season of grief. We lost normalcy. I want to walk this very carefully. But if we can't change our question from why God to what, God? What do you want to produce in me? I think we can miss out on a treasure in the midst of our suffering. See, there are some things that are only produced in the difficult times, in the bitter providence. Endurance is only produced when things are difficult and you continue on in the Lord. Patience is only produced when things are difficult and you have to exert that. Forgiveness. You learn to forgive when someone sins against you. 
And that hurts and it's painful. And we see tons of pictures in the Bible of people coming to God. God, this hurts. It, it's painful. God wants you to bring that to him. But if we can bring that and say, okay, it hurts. I'm listening. What do you want to produce in me? What are you doing in my heart right now? You know what Pam learned? God wanted her to rest more. She has a tendency to work and work and work. And some of these physical ailments that she had, she said, I realize God just wants me to lay down and rest, trusting him. What is your response in the bitter providence? You see, in sweet providence, we tend to drift. In bitter providence, we tend to blame God. Can you say, even in the bitter providence, I thank you that you are a good God who's in control of a painful situation that I don't understand. So there's this narrative of Ruth, right? That, that, that it's, it's a love story. It's a narrative love story, but it's not just a Hallmark movie of the Bible, okay? There's no flannel. There's no little cupcakery bakery. This is, there's a, a meta narrative that's going on here. That, that God is showing us a picture of Jesus. Boaz, a man of standing and stature and godliness, is a picture of Jesus. And he kneels down to offer sacrificially to a pagan woman that he might bring her into his family through levirate marriage. This is a picture of Jesus, the God-man who came to the earth, lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't. We could never attain what he did in his life. Never sinned. And then he died the perfect sacrificial death for you and I on the cross. And when we repent of our sin, repentance means turning from sin and place our faith in Jesus, we can have eternal life. We get adopted into God's family, much like Ruth comes into Boaz's family. Spoiler alert, by the way. But this is a picture. Boaz is a picture of Jesus. There's a meta narrative happening here. It's a picture of the grace of God. Look at it again. Verses eight and nine. Boaz said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, do not go and glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said to him, why, why have I found favor? Right, Boaz is a picture of Jesus and Ruth is a picture of us. Why have I found favor? This is a question we should all ask. God, why have I found favor in your eyes? Like, I know my rap sheet. It's not good. Why have I found favor? Boaz is a picture of grace. God's grace towards you and I, sinful, rebellious, wicked-hearted people. It's a picture of his grace towards us in Jesus. And I think, really, there's, two ways to look at Boaz. Number one, the picture of Jesus, but also he is a vessel of God's grace. This is a man of mission. He, he is on mission pursuing, uh, giving grace to Ruth. We see him lavishly giving to her. And I just want to ask the question, where are you like Boaz in your life? See, I, I think sometimes we make discipleship such a lofty idea in our own minds. But this is a man of mission. And those areas where you're like Boaz, where you're talking to people about coming under the wings of the God of Israel, of the true God of Jesus, and you talk and you show them what a grace-filled, God-fearing life looks like, that is mission. And I want to say this carefully because I don't want anybody to leave condemned or shamed. Shame leads to condemn condemnation, but conviction can lead to transformation. If the mission you're on ends with you, it is not the mission of Jesus Christ. 
If the gospel you believe in ends with you, I have my relationship with God, I'm good to go. If it ends with you, it's not the gospel of Jesus. We cannot be content to have the gospel and not share it. We see Boaz as a picture of a man on mission sharing lavish grace, someone who does not deserve it, that she might be redeemed. I'm going to release to the campuses, Jesus loves you, and so do I. Okay. So a couple of challenges I want to leave us with to make a, uh, this a tangible thing that we can begin to live out. The first question I want to ask is, where is God working in your sphere of influence? And here's one of the ways we can know. I want you to write this down. Begin with prayer. Begin with prayer. Ask God to hit you upside the head with a two by four about the people that he is drawing to himself. Ask him to have those light bulb moments about the people in your sphere of influence at work, home, school, wherever you are, that he is drawing to himself, that he's working in. And then the second thing I want to ask is how can you join him in what he's doing? And here's what I want to challenge you to. Just listen to their story. Listen to their story and, and, and listen to their heart, what's going on in their family, their finances, their workplace. Listen to what they're looking for, for salvation. And then you can share the gospel accordingly. So begin with prayer and listen to their story. Don't have your answers revving. So listen. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Ruth that is a picture of redemption. Thank you that this is a picture of the Gentiles, people like myself, coming into your plan of salvation. And God, I, I ask you to help us this week to be people on mission wherever we go, like Boaz, in your name. Amen.